Dear Heavenly Father, we come up for your throne today. First of all, we just need to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the new day, new opportunities you've given us on the day. Realizing, Lord, you did not have to do it. Oh, God, you could have taken us on last night, but you saw fit your grace and mercy to extend us another day, and we say thank you, God, right now. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for just having a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you for this opportunity uh, to be in the house of worship just one more time, Father God. It may not be in the house physically, but, God, but you allowed, you made it physically, so... They were able to sit here, Father God, in our homes, oh, Father God, and still be able to connect with, with our congregation and, and connect one another to worship you, oh, Father God. Nothing can get in your way of uh, worshiping you, oh, Father God. So we thank you for this day, oh, Father God. Lord, we come before your throne this morning, oh, God. We ask you, Lord, to be not only through me, Father God, speak through me. Let them hear you, hear your words, Father God. Let the hearts of, the, of, the, of man hear you as well, oh, Father God. Uh, may uh, hearts be convicted, oh, Father God, of the direction they may be going, uh, cho choices that we're making, thoughts that may be having, oh, Father God, to, to go another direction which pleases you, oh, Father God. Lord, we thank you for this day, this opportunity, Lord. We ask all in the name of Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're glad on today to be here uh, another day to actually to uh, come before you today. So we thank you for the time this morning. We'll not hope we'll hold you long on today. We'll get right to our text this morning. Uh, it's coming out of the book of Colossians, chapter number 3. That's Colossians chapter number three, and we'll be in verses number twelve, uh, verses twelve through sixteen. That's Colossians chapter three, verses twelve through sixteen, and it reads as such: uh, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, mercy, uh, kindness, humbleness of, of mind, meekness, long suffering, uh, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against one another, uh, even as, as Christ forgave you, so you all, so also do ye. And above all things, uh, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, uh, to, the, to, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your in your hearts to the Lord. We'll stop right there. We'll probably expound a little bit further than that as we go. But uh, let us let us think about this on this morning. Uh, the identity of the new man. The identity of the new man. Uh, we're dealing with uh, scripture on the day. Uh, those who may have been in the classes before, um, dealing with scripture on the day where uh, Paul, who is in jail, is now writing unto the church here and trying to, and trying to let them know about some things. There's a little bit of invasion going on with heresy, and the, the Gnostics are now coming on the scene, and there's people coming on the scene who are now who are Jews and Gentiles are mixing, are mixing, and what's happening there is now the, the, the identity of Christ is now being confused, it's discombobulated, it's being watered down, uh, it's being, uh, being trying to be uh, basically erased, and so Paul, uh, with urgency, is writing to the church uh, to to push them, encourage them to stay strong. And we think about some of the things that we do in life. There's sometimes we need encouragement. There's sometimes we need people to push us and be in our corner. And uh, the people we need people to stand by us and to uh, give us motivation as we go. And you think about that a little bit as, as, a, as, as a little bit of this, that Paul saw an opportunity where he needed he need to influence. He needed to be able to uh, let them know uh, uh, what they should be doing, and so you think about this, and why it's so important is that the fact of the matter is that when we're in the when we're in the environment where people don't know Christ, we can't be like them. I heard and talk on Sunday school this morning about conforming and transforming, and we can't conform to what's going on in society just because it's, uh, that's what everybody's doing. We must trans be transformed by renewing of our mind and be like Christ Jesus. He called us out of darkness to be like Him, not to identify with the world, but to identify with Christ. The problem with that is too many times we find ourselves uh, 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 placing on dirty clothes. And when I say that, uh, we, when we get out of showers most times, we, uh, we, we, we put on clean clothes. There's no way, there, there's no thought in our mind anyway that comes up that says, I should put on these dirty clothes. I should put on these dirty clothes again because that's what I had on before. 
That's why I'm comfortable in. No, you don't put dirty clothes on because they're dirty. And what happens here is that Paul is trying to encourage, by, and, and a little bit before that, he starts going into uh, some of the dirty clothes experiences here. He, he starts talking about the dirty, some of the dirty things that, that identify with dirty clothes. And he talks about the, the fornication. He talks about uncleanliness and evil desires. And talks about idolatry and anger and malice and filthy language. All these things identify with dirty clothes or the old man experience. And what Paul is trying to remind us is that we are no longer that old man. And what I, what I mean by that is that we're no longer the person we was before we came to Christ. We are no longer the person we were before before Christ saved us. When Christ came into our life and saved us, then there should be a, there should be a change that comes upon our life. Now I know we don't all change. Uh, uh, just, just that at the snap of our fingers, it takes some work. It's a process that goes on, a sanctification process that goes on. But we should be striving to be better. We should be striving to be different. We should be striving to identify with Christ. And by identifying with Christ, we're looking like him. We're walking like him. We're talking like him. We should be the best example of him in this big, wide world. We don't want to take on what the world has to offer. We don't want to take on what the world would have for us to do. We are saved. We are changed. We Therefore, we should act like it. And that's basically what Paul is trying to say here, is that you are a new person. You are a new identity. And now I need, I need you to act like it. I need you to be that new person. It's not it's not it's not so much it's for me, it's for it's for Christ Jesus. He needs you to be to behave in a different way. He needs you to walk in a different way. He needs you to talk in a different way because you know him, because you love him, and because you know and love him, you should show that. Why? Because there's people out here that don't know him, that don't love him, don't have no have no inkling of him and no identity to him. And then the only way they're gonna get identity to him is if, you, if maybe you will show that lifestyle of Christ in your daily walk. By you showing that lifestyle of Christ in your daily walk, you don't become that hypocrite that others will call will call others to be. You walk and talk the, the things of the scripture says, and therefore by doing so, you're helping those that don't know him possibly come to him. Your evangelism is made strong that way. Your witness is made strong that way. You're able to tell your brothers and sisters and, and classmates about Jesus because you look like the man you say you're serving. There's no way I can go tell somebody about Christ and I'm doing all the filthy things and, and things they talked about before of the old man it talks about in verses 5 through 11. If I'm doing the old man dirty. If I'm putting, if I'm putting back on the dirty clothes, I can't witness for a new creed, a new, a new Christ. I can't witness for, uh, witness for a Christ that changed me. If I'm still walking in my dirty clothes, I, now, when I had my dirty clothes on, yet He still saved me. But now that I, now that I'm saved and I'm changed, I'm not, I'm not putting on that that dirty clothes anymore of the old man. Now I do dirty my clothes up because I, I still, I still, I still trickle in sin every, every so often. But what happens is that because I know Christ now, He's able to clean me up. Because I know Christ now, He's able to wash me and cleanse me. But I'm, now I want to give that same Christ to somebody else. But the problem is that I can't do that if I'm if I'm continuing to behave in the same manner that I did before. Young people, we talk about all the time about a new behavior, a change behavior. That change behavior has to start working when you start to, uh, you start thinking to yourself, I need to be better. And because mom and dad lay out the line on how you should be better, but you have to own up to it. You have to want that new identity. You have to want to walk different and talk different and live different. And by doing so, you're identifying with Christ. And when you're identifying with Christ, you help your, your classmates and, uh, and other uh, family members, other kids that don't know him, come to him because you're identifying with the man who saved you. And so when we look at the scripture on the day, uh, there's some things in scripture today that, that, that are the, the, the new practical identity of what Christ looks like. Uh, 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 we're going to look at how the new man characteristics that Christ needs us to apply to show the world we belong to him, show the world that, we, that, we're, that we're saved, show the world we are changed. I'm going to run through these things rather quickly so we won't be here all, all morning. But some things here, it's a meat here he wants us to see that help us understand a few things here. First of all, when it goes down and it gets down in verse number 12, it talks about the, uh, the elect. Uh, the elect of God and the holy, holy and beloved. It talks about this in the manner that we are all have been chosen by God. And when we think about this, He has all chosen all of us to uh, to, uh, to, to know Him, to to a relationship with Him. But we have to actually confess Him. He, he's come to us and, and allowed us to be to be tapped by Him, to acknowledge Him and believe in Him. But we have to still confess in Him. But you think about how He, how he did that. He chose us uh, uh, before the foundation of the world even was created. When you think about what He did and how much He loved. Us, how much he tapped into us that even before you were created, for your parents were created, he still you still were the elect of God. You still were the chosen one of God. And because and because he did that, he he showed his love for us. 
I mean, think about here in verse, Ephesians 4, 1, 4, uh, 4 through 5. It says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ in him according to the good pleasure of, of his will. He hadn't said that we were going to acknowledge him. He knew what we were going we to acknowledge him now. He did, we had to still confess, but he knew what we were going to do before we were going to do it. If he did not know that, he would not be God. And so we think about uh, how he's trying to get us to look like him. He wants you to approach you up first. He wants you to know how much he loves you, how much he's been there for you, how much he's cared about you. How much he's in your corner. You are the holy uh, beloved. Holy beloved. Holy, you're set apart. You're, you're, you're sanctified, set apart. He has you doing different things in the world. Think about this. If I'm going to identify with Christ, I can't do the things of the world that the bad people are doing. If I'm, do the, if I'm going to identify with Christ, I can't be doing the things of the world that the, the, that the negative people are doing. I can't do the things of the world that the criminals are doing. I can't do the things of the world that people are do, committing violence are doing. I have to be different. I have to be changed. I have to be set apart. I have to be sanctified, which means I'm trying to get rid of all the things that are in me that are bad and place them in things that are good. If I'm do, by doing so, I, I, am, I, am, I am transitioning myself to be look more like Jesus. But you can't do it unless you know Jesus. You can't do it by yourself. There's no way I can come and say, well, I've been a good person. I've been a, I have a good heart. I, li- I live a good life. I don't do nobody no wrong and not have Jesus in your life. You can't get into heaven that way. You have to identify with Christ. You have to confess Christ first. And by confessing Christ, means you, means that means it was up. Uh, that you, that you believe in Christ Jesus, and because you believe in Christ Jesus, now you take on his identity because you are, he is your, now your example. And so because of, that, uh, because of that, I am walking, trying to be more like him. Being more like him is being holy. It's being set apart. It, it, it's living a different lifestyle than those who do not know him. I have, the only way I can do that is if I, in, if I live in him. If I live in him. It says, and then verse 12 says, put on. It says, put, in verse 12 it says, put on here. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, 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 put on, ten, it says put on to the mercy, but put on. We talk about the, the clothes here. I'm taking off the old clothes in, in verses 5 through 11. The, the, the 5 through 11 were the dirty clothes. But it says now put on these new clothes now. It says, it says put on to the mercy. It's now telling you, engaging us now that we're going to now put on new clean clothes. Now we have the old man. We have flipping language and the fornication and, and acting dip and bad and living and living bad. All those things that we were doing before that were identified with sin. Now it says put on, take off those dirty clothes, put on these new clean clothes now because why because i'm putting on a new a new relationship i'm putting on a new identity now i'm no longer trying to identify with the world no more i'm no longer trying to identify with my classmates no more i'm no longer trying to identify with people in my family no more i'm trying to identify with christ he is my identity and because he is my identity i have to now put on the new clothes that identify with him and so therefore when i do that I'm, I'm, I look different now. Why? Because I'm in a room with people with dirty clothes on. And I'm the only one that has clean clothes on. I stand out. Why do I stand out? Because I put on a new identity. I'm not trying to conform and be like everybody else. I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I, I, uh, uh, I am, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to look like the man I say that I believe in. I can't just take talk. I just can't talk this game. I just can't talk this whole thing about Christ and not identify with him. I can't go to church on Sunday morning and sing songs on Sunday and those type of things and, 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 and sing about a man that I don't necessarily believe in and don't live for. I have to take this thing on 24-7. I have to live in Christ 24-7 which means my mind should be beating on him. My heart should be beating on him. My, 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 wherever I walk, should identify with him. Wherever I, wherever I touch, should be, he should approve. All those things are putting on that new clean clothes. I, I, I've taken off the dirty ones now. But he goes a little bit further now. He said, now he said, put on now. He said, put on now. Now he's going to tell you what to put on. He's going to say, put on to the mercies. What is that? That's a heart, it's a heart of compassion. When, we, when we're living in Christ Jesus, we have the heart of compassion. Why? Because Jesus has the heart of compassion. He says here uh, in, in Matthew 36, uh, 9, 36, and 37, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because, he, because they fainted and, and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto the disciples, the harvest truly is plenty, but the laborers are, flu- are few. Pray ye, therefore, the laborers of the harvest, that ye will f- send forth laborers into the harvest. He was had compassion on what was the situation, which means that only did he see what was going on, he did something about it. You can't have the compassion about some things if you just look at it and say, man, that man struggling for some food. I hope, so, hope he gets some. Oh, man, he, uh, she needs some clothes. I hope she finds some. Oh, he, he needs a, he needs a uh, it's raining outside. It's an umbrella. Uh, he don't have no room. 
Well, I hope he falls, I hope he gets one. That just identifies the situation. The compassion is I gotta I gotta move every mile to make sure he gets that umbrella. I gotta move every mile to make sure he gets a little bit of food. I gotta move every mile to make sure she gets some clothes. Then now the compassion in my heart is like Jesus was. The, you see where I'm going? That we have to identify how Jesus was, and far too many times we identify what we want to do. We identify with ourselves, and young people, we can't necessarily we can't identify ourselves and still follow Christ. If we're gonna identify with Christ. We have to move how Christ would move. We have to move how Christ would talk. We have to live how Christ would live. And everything that we do should be should be balanced by that measure. That we, when when Jesus was having compassion, He moved on the situation. Now we can. We may not have the means to take care of the situation, but we, uh, and, and, and that, that, that always happens at times. But, but we, should not, we shouldn't walk away from the situation and say, man, I hope something happens in that. Or this, or this, that like we don't see it at all. We should get on our knees and pray. We should say, Lord, I don't have any change to give him. I don't have any money to give him, but I'm praying, oh, Lord, that you send somebody that will come down and give him some glory. That you'll send somebody that will bring a, a place up there. Why? Because I have the heart of compassion. And so he goes on a little bit further. In verse number 12, it talks more about, uh, uh, about kindness here. It says uh, about unselfish, which is having an unselfish spirit. And, and, and far too many times in our, in our churches, we, get, we identify the spirit of selfishness. Uh, we, uh, we, we find our way ourselves to be identifying with selfishness too many times. It's my, me, myself, and I. This is what I want to do. We need to, this is what we need to do. And, and this type of thing, we, 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 do, we move on what we want to do instead of moving on what the Spirit of the Lord wants us to do. And far too many times, we find ourselves struggling too many times because we identify with our own path and our own plan. We identify the true master planner is Jesus. When we go back in Matthew 11, it says this, 11, 28, and 29, Come unto ye, all uh, ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I, and I, for I am meek and lowly in, in heart, and you shall find rest in your soul, for, your, for my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. Christ is said, not giving something to you, right? And so we think about the unselfish part of this, that Christ uh, didn't, uh, when he died, he could have took it all with him and said, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I ain't worried about nobody else. I'm going to take care of my, me, myself, and I. But when he, when he, the, the sole purpose of him dying was not for him. It was for us. And so you think about what he did it was always unselfish. So we cannot harbor our identity ourselves because it wasn't in Christ. Because it wasn't in Christ, there's no way the church should look like selfishness. I mean, this letter, this epistle was written to the church. Which means it's not for the outsiders. It's not for those who don't know him. It's not for people that that, that are struggling to try to get to come to church. It's not those uh, those who are slow enough to serve him. It's just for this is for the body the body of Christ. He's he's right right this letter Paul is to the to the church members to the congregation. You and to I. Why? Because these things were prevalent back then. There were issues going on. There were concerns going on. And Paul's trying to remind us right here now. That the church cannot identify with the world. And, if the, and, and when you talk about the church, it's talking about you and I. We cannot identify with the world because if we identify with the world, if we're not identify with Christ, if we're not identify with Christ, how are we ever going to help somebody that's lost come to Christ? We have to identify with him. We have to be humble. We have to have humility. We have to be, uh, 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 which is the absence of pride. We can't look like that. We can't have pride built up in our heart. Jesus didn't have any pride built up in his heart. If he had pride, he would say, "This is me, myself, and I. I'm big bad. I'm the big bad wolf. I'm doing everything. This time, you won't, you ain't doing nothing." He never talked like that. He never said it was like that. Now he knew what he was doing. He knew it was him, but he didn't talk like that. He was so meek and, 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 uh, and lonely that he he did he, he had the absence of pride. Pride wasn't there. But too many of us live on pride. We live on pride, and we, and pride is is a sin. We can't live on pride. Pride is not what what Christ was. We should not. Uh, we should be willing to be humbled and be esteem uh, other uh, to esteem others better than ourselves. We should be lifting up the people around us. We should lift up the flock. We should be lifting up those who uh, are come to our presence, encouraging them. Not not just when they come around. You talk about yourself. Now you come around and say, "Well, you would have done it if I hadn't if I hadn't done this for you." We shouldn't be doing that. Now in our mind, we may know some of those things, but it's not for us to just go out to say those things. Why? Because it causes division between one another. It causes strain because of one another, and words can hurt one another. Therefore, we shouldn't be looking to get glorified. We should be looking to be lifted up ourselves. If someone will lift it up, let somebody lift you up later on and want to tell you what you did. That's perfectly fine. They won't do that. But our job is to go out and lift others up, encourage others, pour into others, feed into others. Why? Because Jesus did. Oh, man. The, the, the whole thing about meekness is this. 
is that there's three things about meeting it. There's submission, there's teachability, and there's consideration, consideration for others. When you think about his, who Jesus was, and you think about what it said in Matthew 5, 5 and 5, it said, the meek shall inherit the earth, uh, uh, shall inherit the earth. When you think about that, uh, it comes back from uh, Psalm 37, 11, where it also says that they, it also says at the end of that, it says they start to light themselves in the abundance of peace. When you talk about this here, a whole lot of things going on. When you think about this, is that when you think about being meek, Think about denying yourself, which means that you, you are one that, 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 that submits to his word, his way, and his direction. You think about this, that you're able to be taught. When you have too much pride in your heart, can't nobody teach you nothing. When you got too much pride in your heart, can't nobody tell you what to do because you'll be offended by it. You'll be hurt by it. And when people won't do it, they know where your heart is, and they won't tell you nothing. They say, well, she ain't going to do it no way. Somebody want you, they might want you to read a psalm or something like that. I want you to read a scripture. And they say, well, I ain't going to ask her to read a scripture because she ain't going to read it no way. You know, it's because they, they already know. When, you, when you're teachable, you're able to say, you know what? Let me go, let me, uh, whatever you ask me to do, I'm willing to do. Why? Because my heart is open to do whatever you want me to do. Why? Because that's how Jesus was. And when you think about how I've conducted myself, we think about how we conducted ourselves over the years, we can go back over the years and count the men and see how many times we weren't teachable. We weren't, we didn't have submission and we didn't, uh, consider, consider others. We had a heart of vengeful. We had a heart that was mean, a heart that was vile. But I'm trying to let you know that there's a new day coming along when you came to Christ and because you struggled with it before, don't be able to struggle with it right now. You can put on this new identity. You can you can wrap yourself in scripture and put, and draw deep in your heart and mind and soul and walk this thing out. That no, you no longer have to be readers of the new word only, but also doers of the word. As it says in James, we have to be the church that Christ needs us to be and help others help others come to Christ. When you think about it a little further, it goes on. It says long suffering, which is a patience. And you think about the doctor, I think about Dr. This is about Dr. King a lot. He had long suffering. He was going through all kinds of things. He and people always say, why did he do violence? You think about Malcolm X. They say, well, Ma- Malcolm was by, by the gun, and, 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 and uh, 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 King was by protests and sit-ins and boycotts and stuff like that. He said, we don't, we need to stop doing that and, and put the gun. He King had long suffering. He chilled, he chilled because he said, you know what? This is this is it's about, it's about a man greater than I. This is the direction we're gonna go on. Why? Because you think about what Jesus did. How how many times could Jesus could have had retaliation? How come many times Jesus could have just went on and did what he wanted to do? But long suffering and patience trying to remind us that there's, there's a blessing in patience. There's a patience a blessing in long suffering. It comes in Romans 2 and 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the, that the goodness of God leads you to rep- uh, rep- repentance? The goodness of God is in, the, in long suffering. Just hold on. It may not be how you want it to be. Just hold on. It may not, it may not be be as you need it to be or wish it to be or, or pray for it to be, but just hold on. Our rushing will get us in trouble. Our eagerness will get us in trouble. Our pride will get us in trouble. Just hang on in there. Long suffering means you keep you on your knees sometimes. Long suffering means it keeps you in, 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 uh, 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 crying on your knees sometimes. Long suffering means I'm going to hold on. I'm, I'm going to keep hopeful for it. Long suffering means that I know the Lord's going to bring it out somehow the way. I don't know when, don't know where, but I know he's coming with it. Long suffering means I'm holding on to God's unchanging hand. Long suffering is the hope. It, 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 it's peace in the middle of the storm. Things are disarray around me, but in the middle of that, I got peace. Why do I got peace? I got patience in Jesus Christ. I know what he's going to do. When you, and you, when you have that patience and have that peace, you know what, and what God's going to do. You you can chill right there. Why? Because you know God's in full control. And when he decides to do it, that's when he's going to do it. And when he does it, I'll, I'll be ready for it. If he do it now, great. If he does it later, great. But until then, I have peace. Why do I have peace? Because I know it's all in God's hand. Let me get to wrap this thing up here. See, it goes a little further. It says, bear, bear with one another in verse 13. The patience to, to, that we should have when, when the feelings and, uh, and our, our, our brothers fail and our brothers go through things, that we should bear our, 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 with one another. One another go through a lot of different things. Our, 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 our friends, our family, our loved ones, they go through a lot of different things. But how many times you bear those, bear those burdens with them? How many times you hold them up and them up and pray for them. You think about relationships sometimes. In relationships, you, you both of you all go go the same go through things in relationships. But you think about it, if you if you uh, 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 remove yourself from that person when they're going through, how strong that relationship going to be? It's not going to be very strong. And, he's try, and Christ is trying to remind you that I bear one with one another. I supported one another. I was holding on the burden for one another. So he said, you're, he's, a, he's so encouraging us, that new person, new identity we are, we have to be willing to do that with one another. But also, we have to be willing to forgive one another. Oh, man. And that's the problem we struggle with one time, probably the most thing. So how many times are we thinking about if we have a gotten to with somebody, how we uh, had an argument with somebody, and you never speak 
again. You have an argument or a fight with somebody and you haven't talked in years, and you and the first thing you say is, well, that's on them. They ain't said nothing to me. Well, you think about it, that's not how Christ moves. You can't move like that. You say, well, let me let me go dead in this thing. You know, that's 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 that's, that's sitting between me and God. I can't let this thing sit between me and God. I I need to go for, I need to go get this thing straight. They may not ever forgive me, but I'm coming to the Lord. Uh, I'm gonna bury the hatchet right now. Why? Because that's, that's our new identity. We can't hold that burden forever. We can't hold that. And when we decide to do that, there come those sins that we have in the closet that we haven't repented for. We think about this. Uh, we got forgiveness that should be exercised towards others when they have offended us. And we have to be willing to, young people, have to understand, we can't, we can't handle every argument by, uh, about not talking to one another, by pulling out a gun or a weapon or just trying to fight. Sometimes we got to say, you know what, what would God want me to do? And that's how we should be behaving anyway. And, the, and no matter what's going on, what would the Lord want me to do? When he says here, uh, 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 in Matthew 6, 14, 15, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive, me, forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. So you think about that written right there. Christ has placed the fork in the sand and said, When you don't forgive, I ain't forgiving you. He, so he's trying to know that that stands between you and God, that those things stand in between you and him, that in order to erase those things, you have to be willing to do these things. Why? Because you take on a new identity of which he was already doing. Think about it. He don't have to forgive you for your stuff in the first place. He went to fall, Calvary's heel for you before you. He didn't have to do that. He's trying to remind you right now. If you got, if you if you have forgiven somebody, do it now because I, that's, that's standing in the way, the way of me forgiving you. So there's some prayers that haven't gotten through. There's some forgiveness that haven't gotten through because we have we got stakes in our own ground. Say I'm not forgiving that person. I have not. I, I, I don't want to. But Christ is telling you right here in the Scripture that you must. Why? It's, it's the new identity of Jesus with Jesus, and so. And since we identify him, we take on his likeness. We take on his example. We do as he would do. And so we can no longer conform our minds to the worldly thoughts and worldly rationalization. We have to conform. We can't conform our mind to what my teachers say and what the people say in the world. We conform our, we transform our mind, renew our mind, and what Christ wants to do. We used to think worldly before we came to Christ, but now that we know Christ, we think like he thinks. So therefore, our mind should be transformed in him. So now, if I have some problem before, I, I fix it by following Jesus' way of direction. But we come back, he comes back a little bit further and says, 14, that love, charity, comes in as the best the holds all this together. It says here in uh, 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 1 Corinthians 13, 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, and so that I can remove mountains, and have not charity, I have nothing. He goes up further later on, I don't have time today, but we think about the love. When we don't have the love in our heart, we can't do nothing for Jesus. We don't have the love in our heart. We don't have, we don't, we can't move a mechanical for him. We have to move in love. When we move in love, we can do all these things. When we move in love, we can long suffer. When we move in love, we can be we can be meek. When we move in love, we can be humble. When we move in love, we can have kind and tender mercies. When we move in love, we can put on these new clothes. Because why? That leads us to the peace. Oh, my goodness. Let's see what the peace. Verse number 15, it says, and let the peace of God rule your heart. When I think about this here, I think about a time when uh, I was I had a new job I could apply for, and uh, they, 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 they called and offered me the job. It, I had an 8% rate or something like that, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was messing with my spirit. I remember calling Carolyn Lucas, and I called Carolyn. I said, Carolyn, I got this job offer here, and I'm, and I'm struggling with it. And she kept talking to me, and we prayed about it, and she said, go with, a, go with your heart. It's moving you to go. I said, I don't know. I'm inside the other. And then what happened was I prayed some more. I remember talking to the pastor after that. And the pastor was like, you know, it's Satan and godly counsel. We, I told him I talked to Carolyn. And we, we, but he never told, they never told which way to go. And so I prayed about it, prayed about it. And then when I called the people and told them, you know what, I'm not taking the job. You don't know what the peace that came over my body? I, my body was calm. The anger, the anxious went away. The 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 the, 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 the in my heart and the pity part of my heart went away. It was a peace. And I remember calling Carolyn. I said, Carolyn, I got so much peace in my mind now. I got so peace in my heart. And then Pastor told me, yeah, that must have been the right thing to do because why? Because I followed the will and the way of the Lord. I could have picked that when and got when after that job and picked it because it had it had more money. But that wasn't what the Lord wanted me to do. He said, stay where you are, and I stayed put and have patience, right? And because I had patience, He gave me that peace, and I had so much peace. And when, and when the man that I turned the job down, saw me. He couldn't even look at me in the face because he was mad that I turned down the job. But I walked by, by 
head stuck up high. Why? I had to hold peace because I know what God was telling me to do. And so when I think about that, I, I, I know I'm going to try by fire. I know I'm going to try this word by his word. I know I tried his word in his way. And he said, just prove me by just trying me. And I did that just right there. So I know about that peace when it comes in. Because when the peace came in, it cold my body. Uh, the, the hotness went away. The sweating went away. All because I, I gave him to the will and the way. I said, Lord, you usher this. Whatever you want to do. And he was trying to tell him what to do without telling people what to do. He, he gave me godly counsel, but then he told him what to do. He told me to follow me. And, and what's on my heart, he said, some just say, say no. And when I said no, all the, the, my body is calmed down. I sat in that chair. I go to my daily business. And yet, what about nobody saying? Here, people were mad at me because I turned it down. But I had peace. And because I had peace, I was like, I said, Lord, thank you. And, I, and it was some, some years later, the Lord blessed me for the opportunities I walk into now that I'm doing what I want to do. But I, but I, can I hold on with patience and long suffering? But also, rather mind is that uh, 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 that we should also, uh, 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 which also said we are called into one body in fifteen. It says, uh, it says so we also called to one body and be thankful. We wrap this thing up here. That when we're called into one body, we, a lot of times we think about we can, we church at home, we can do what we want to do everywhere else. Um, uh, we should we can we can do by our lonely, but we, we, what it needs us to do is to be. Uh, a, 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 if we're in all one body of Christ. Now we're all different in this body. We all have different uh, thoughts, different mindsets, and become different uh, different environments, those type of things. But we have one thing in common, which is Jesus. And because of one thing in common, we're all have the same likeness in, in, in common. Therefore, we and within that we can encourage and motivate one another. I'm struggling with what I'm going on right now, but I called on Carolyn because she because I knew she's a, she's a she was one of the body of believers with me and. We, and I'm in that one body with her. I knew she would know what to say. I knew what she would know. Why? Because I, cause we're in this, I, I didn't try to do a thing by myself. I, I, I'm around like-minded believers, and that's the power of being around a congregation. That's the power of being around like-minded believers. That's the power of, of, loving, of loving Christ and, 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 and being where Christ teach you to be, teach you to go to church at. Why? Because when that, in that body of like-minded believers, there's encouragement. There's love. There, there, there's people that try to lift you up. And there's people that take care of you. Why? Because they love you, and they, have, they share the same Christ. But they also try to remind us here, he said, be thankful. When you think about this verse here, that it was thankful that it was asked to give up. Thankful was being thankful is, 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 is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible. It must be for a reason. It's very important. Why is it important? Because we must give thanks to God. Must give thanks to God because what he has done in our life, he did not have to do. Because what he, he because him going across, he did not have to do anything. He had to bless you with a house, bless you with a car, bless you with food on your table, bless you with a few on your feet, bless you with some nice clothes, clothes to wear. He had to bless you with a nice job and these type of things. He had to bless you with anything. He did not have to do anything for you. All you needed to do was go to cross and die, and you should have been satisfied with that. But, we, but he gave you all these things he's given you and taking care of you and your family, your loved ones and friends and all this stuff over the years. We should be thankful. I got breath this morning. Thank you. I have food on the table. Thank you. Well, I've been coming here and give you a, a sermon. Thank you. It's all because what all Christ has been doing in our life, we should be thankful. But too many times we take it, take it for granted. We don't give things like we should. Why don't we start our prayer with thanksgiving? Because why? Because God, you've been th I'm thankful to you, oh Lord, because what you've been doing in my life. Thank you, O Lord, for allowing me to see another day. I see we take that for granted for some, some, so too many often times that we think about what's going on with COVID and things happening right now. There's too many things going on right now. Death is creeping in on all corners, it seems like. But we think about it. He let me see another day. You know, because that, that day has never been proper to you, and therefore we should be thankful for it. So our thanksgiving should be wide open. Our thanksgiving should be daily. Our thanksgiving should be happening every minute, every hour because of what he's been doing in our life. And so... We, when we think about what he's doing, we should always be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with wisdom, teaching, and modesty. We think about that. The word of Christ should be tattooed in your heart. The word of Christ should be wherever you go, everywhere you go, everywhere you go, young people, school, home, work, wherever it might be, it should be on you. Why? Because the devil sends people around you trying to bring you down. The devil sends people around you trying to swallow you up. The devil brings people around you trying to steal your joy away. He's trying to remind you if you just walk with this word in your heart, in your mind and soul, and wherever you go, make sure you lift up Jesus, and wherever you go, whatever you do, you think, would Jesus let me do this? Would Jesus be cool if I do this? Would, would is any praise I do, any, any praise for Christ if I do this? Would Christ be pleased by this? And you think like that and walk like that and live like that? Then you're, you're walking in that new identity with Christ, and he is pleased by that. But when you walk around this world, Say about yourself. Do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. Go where you want to go. And don't ever communicate with him. He's not pleased with that at all. He wants us to identify with him, not just on Sunday.
Not just on Wednesday, not just on prime rehearsal, not just when the mission meets, not just when the land meets, but every day of the week, every hour of the week, he wants us to identify with the risen Savior because if we identify the risen Savior and help somebody don't know for the part of their sins, come to Christ and say, why are you so different? Why are you so changed? What happened to you? You used to be different before. You used to cuss all the time. You used to talk crazy all the time. You, you talk about people all the time. You don't do it no more. What happened? What changed? i tell you why I changed. Because I met a man named Jesus. When I met this man named Jesus, he, made, he came over my life and changed me. So that's where we got to be. We have, and, you, 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 and you look at me and say, where is, where do I find this example? I will tell you, just look up, young people. Well, where do I find my example? Just look up. Because it says in Psalms 121, and I will lift my eyes unto the hills, will come with my help. He said, just look up. And Matthew 19, 24 and 26 says, and again, I say unto you, is, is it easy for a camel to, uh, to go through uh, the eye of a needle for, a, for, a, then for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God? When the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus said unto them, and said unto, uh, said unto them, with man this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. In Proverbs 3 and 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In Hebrews 12 and 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, this Jesus walked up a hill called Calvary, bearing the sins on his shoulders, a cross on his back. When he got to that hill, they nailed him to the cross, raised him up for all the world to see. Uh, but, the, but Scripture reminds us, in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Blood came streaming down. Within that blood was your sins and my sins. He gave his life up on the cross. They buried him, hoping it was, it was all said and done. But early one Sunday morning, he rose from the grave. First Corinthians 15, uh, 25 says, O death, where is thy sin? O grave, where is thy victory? Because he rose, because the, uh, the, uh, he defeated death. Uh, 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 he, is our, he is our example. He is our way maker. He is the everlasting father. He is our prime example to get through this whole thing called life. And we just take on the full identity of Jesus Christ. Amen. It might be one this morning. Ooh, Lord. It might be one this morning that wants to take on this new identity of Jesus who's ready to take off the dirty clothes of the world, who's ready to take off the dirty clothes of, 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 the, of the old man and ready to walk in a new identity with Jesus, to put on new clean clothes and to be identified with the master, Jesus Christ. There might be one this morning through this line, through this chat, through the virtual, that may say, oh, well, it's time for me to come to Christ. There might be one of this morning. The doors of the church are open at this time. Mm, mm, mm. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, victory! In Jesus, he's my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and oh, I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory with his redeeming blood. Amen. Thank you for that selection. 
uh, realizing that there might be someone on the line this morning uh, that may want to give a life to Christ or may want to have a conversation about that. Uh, our pastor has been uh, open to you calling him on his phone and be able to have a conversation about your relationship with Christ. If there is one this morning that wants to co converse with him, his number is 816-509-1247. If there's anyone this morning that wants to converse with me, is, uh, I'm available as well, 816-616-9168. We can converse about your relationship with Jesus Christ. But it could be someone here this morning who does not have a relationship with Christ, does not have a, may have a relationship with Christ, but may have a church home, though. Uh, you may not you may not have a church home, but the way it's, the way it's so fit is that you don't have to be at the church here necessarily to be a, a become a, a join a, join the church. The Lord said fit that we can even accept your membership on here, and so we have the virtual opportunity to do that. But it might be someone also this morning that might be struggling with something in this thing called life. We realize we put on the the old man uh, tries to do things to us at times, and even in this new identity in Christ, we do struggle with things. You might need some prayer. We're, our prayer lines are available as well. So we want to make sure we are better minister to your needs on this morning and, realize, and open that if you have, uh, want to respond in any kind of way, then we are available to receive that. So at this time, we thank you for your, uh, your hearing us on this morning. We hope the word of God uh, convicts your heart, mind, and soul. You may, have, you may be changed. Thank you so much, Grant. <clears throat> Again, brothers and sisters, we thank you. And for those listening, I hope you can hear me. For those listening, um, if there was anyone this morning on that does not know Jesus and the partner of sin, what uh, Minister Lewis just told you is correct, you can certainly contact us, and we will be happy to pray with you and to share with you some scriptures that will help you to be assured of your salvation. God is not the author of confusion. Only the devil wants you confused and don't know what to do. And so the way that we eliminate the devil's confusion is by the promises that God gives in his word. And he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And brother or sister, that includes you. Because there isn't any soul that's ever been born on this earth or no soul that ever will be born upon this earth that God doesn't know in totality already. And so if you don't know him, this invitation is for you. I want to again thank each of you this morning for your uh, participation. And just before we call Minister Lewis back <clears throat> to give us the final remarks and the benediction, I do want to ask you to add someone else to the prayer list that I failed to mention earlier. Uh, I don't have the um, name of the family, but there's a family that lives right down the street from the church that we have been involved in helping somewhat uh, a little bit from time to time. And some of them, I think one of the granddaughters uh, actually united with the church. Please be in prayer for this family because we understand that they also have had a loss uh, in their uh, family. Uh, we don't have, at least I don't have it before me. I think it's been sent, but I don't have it before me, the um, services. But uh, some of you who have been working with this family, know who I'm speaking of, so please be in prayer for that family. And then just to remind you that we'll be back to our normal schedule of things this coming week. Uh, Tuesday, we will continue our chat with the pastor. We'll continue to talk about the things that we have outlined, um, looking for all our young people, anyone else that want to be involved. We invite you this time, 7 o'clock on Tuesday for one hour. And then uh, we'll be back to our regular Bible study and prayer on Wednesday. Lord says the same also at 7 o'clock. And then next Friday at 7 o'clock is our church business meeting. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. Let's continue to pray one for the other. If you have to move around this city, please be careful, be mindful, uh, and, and um, um, uh, let's just follow the rules that the, um, um, the doctors and, and the other officials of the medical field are telling us to help keep us safe. So please be careful as you move about. At this time, we're back up in the hands of Reverend Lewis. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, one thing I thank Pastor for the opportunity on this morning. Uh, I do pray that through today's message, that uh, our hearts, even starting with mine, are, are convicted, are changed, uh, that we consider and think about more of what we do and how we live, how we walk, and how we talk. More, make sure we're more identified with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, even, it's, for the, it's for the kingdom. We, we do this for, and we thank God for, his, for him doing what he did for us. And because of that, we continue to 
work for him for kingdom building. So this time we'll, we'll, we'll bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this opportunity on the day. Lord, we do pray that the heart, the Lord, the word of the Lord will be in our hearts as we leave this place, O oh God, not leave and not leave from us, O oh Lord. That it may be rest on our heart, mind, and soul. That wherever we do, O oh Father God, we can give consideration to you, Father God, for we do, for we say, what we think things, O oh God, that we can give consideration to you, that you will be with us wholly. Father God, enriched in our hearts, mind, and soul, that we are identified with the Christ that you are, Father God, in our daily living, O oh Lord. And Lord, we're thankful for you dying on the cross for our sins, O oh God. We thank you for, um, for, us, uh, for, for your salvation, O oh Father God. And Lord, we just want to do better by you, O oh God, because we know you. Uh, it's now, it's now, to, now unto the King Eternal, immortal, visible, wise God, honor and glory forever and ever, and all the church did say, Amen. 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 Amen.